I am Kendra Ketter Chavis. I live in Nashville uh, with my great husband and our beautiful new baby boy, Titan, who are uh, safely tucked away in the cry room, so no panic for me or for you. If he starts crying, it's fine. <laughs> um, but I'm so grateful um, for that gift in my life and to be able to come and share the gospel uh, and even the gift of just having him hear it, even if he doesn't understand it yet. Um, so thank you all for allowing us to, to be with you this Sunday morning. I wanna get to the most important part of what I have to say. It's not my words, it's not my story, but I wanna start with the most important thing, and that's scripture. Is that okay? So let's go to Matthew chapter 25. I'm gonna read uh, one simple verse. Matthew chapter 25, and I'm gonna read verse 40. And it reads, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least, one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me for me. If you allow me, I would in fact like to share just a little bit of my story. So I grew up in a house with seven kids, two parents, a couple goldfish, in a small community inside of a small town where we literally had more people in our home than we had traffic lights. Growing up in a house with that many children, you can imagine that there are countless debates there are countless opportunities to risk our lives and call it a game. There are missing child alerts in stores. There are nine different food preferences. And God bless my mother who had to become a prayer warrior with a house full of children with a lot of innocent but really, really terrible ideas. With 33 years of children in one house, you can imagine how many times we tried to get away with things and how many times we snitched on each other, right? Because here's the thing, back then it was like, if I'm not getting away with it, nobody is, right? And so go with me here for a second. Aside from, you know, whining things like, his arm is touching me, or his coat is touching me, the things that you know some of you heard this morning as you were trying to get to church, one of the things that my brother and I, I heard somebody laugh, they're like, that was my story, that's my testimony. Uh, one of the things that my brother and I used to always yell out to my mother, he's copying me, right? My brother and I are only 17 months apart. And then between us and the next sibling, it's almost a decade. And so as little almost twins, we always knew exactly how to aggravate each other. And we knew one of the best ways to irritate the other one was copying. I want some chips. No, I want some chips. I have to do my project. No, I have to do my project. I wanna play Sega. Can I play the Sega? I am Sega years old, right? And then it always end up at the pinnacle with me yelling, Ma, Brandon's copying me. And my mother would give us a Bible verse always, and she'd give us a one sentence long lesson reminding us that imitation is the biggest form of flattery and it's a high praise. Now this, of course, made absolutely no sense to us as children, but we did stop in our tracks because we didn't want to hear any more wisdom that did not lead to us just getting our way. And I wanna note, here's the thing, the fact that my mother's sanity to this day survived the seven of us is proof that the Holy Spirit is in fact real. Imitation, a form of flattery, a high praise, says who, right? Fast forward a decade or two, and I begin to learn that somehow imitation is exactly what Jesus was always inviting folks to do. Follow me, go, do what you saw me do. I spent my entire childhood yelling at my baby brother only to learn what many of us have learned, mom is always right. I get to say that now. Here's the thing, a text where we find that truth about imitation to be laid out pretty explicitly is right in Matthew 25. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus presents this message here on the Mount of Olives and it's his final mountainside teaching that we have recording, uh, recorded to his disciples. And of all the things that Jesus can say before his death to his followers, 
He chooses these words. And there's no question that if you know the end is near, you are going to, in fact, choose your words very, very carefully. So if you'll allow me, I'd like to zoom out just a little bit in the text that we have this morning. So we're still in Matthew chapter 25, but if you'll allow me, let's go up just a little bit to verse 31. And it reads, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, He will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and he'll put the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of this world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was a prisoner and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in and need clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you do for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now Jesus says this just two days before he's handed over for crucifixion. It was that important. Jesus says, listen, you're gonna look for me and I'm coming back for the hearts who look like mine. In the verses that follow, Jesus makes clear that he knows exactly how to identify himself when he sees it. He declares from that quiet moment on the mountainside into the depths of eternity, do what I do, say what I say, pour out your life, copy me. Now Jesus gets just three, only three out of his 33 years on earth to declare his supreme divinity to the world, to say how great he is as the foretold savior that everyone had heard about, to brag from door to door, from town to town about the beauty of his heavenly kingdom in comparison to the broken kingdom of the world. And you know what he does with those three years? He serves, he gives. Now if anyone ever deserved to brag, I would say it's Jesus. He owes us nothing, we owe him everything, and still he comes and he chooses relationship and love over isolation and exclusion. And then he invites us into the most divine way of life on this earth. Simply follow me, copy me. Be like the sheep who hear my voice and follow me. And he uses sheep and goats for a reason because some big differences can seem so subtle. Jesus' words here are not a condemning speech. No, they are prophetic declaration about God's discerning eye. How many of you know that all children are not the same, right? God knows that same thing about us. So you usually in a household, right, you have an interesting mix. You have, right, the quiet one, you have the noisy one, You have the messy one. I saw somebody shaking their head. You know exactly what kid that is in your house, right? You have the uncomfortably smart one, right? That's a little too adult. You're like, were you here before? You have the one that has the jokes. And in my house, we were all seven very unique personalities. But sometimes we actually wondered if my mom even knew the difference because you always had at least two names in our house. You had your name and the name of the sibling closest in age to you. So I was, and to this day, am Jennifer Kendra. My brother is Brandon Michael, Sheila Tanya, right? And things like that, so on. But I have to say that there was something really endearing about the blending of the names. Even though we used to make fun of our mother, there was something really endearing about that because we're also what some people would call a blended family. And I never really knew terms like this until several years into elementary school. You know how you have to do those family, uh, the, the little family tree? Well, our big forest got a lot of attention. And I remember a girl asking me if I had stepsisters and I was just kinda like, what is that? And fast forward, we get to middle school and I get more information and now the terms half brother and half sister popped up and this was pretty shocking for me. I remember going home and asking about this and only having to be told once, we don't have that at our house. 
We are one family. And this made perfect sense to me. After all, no one was ever treated differently or fractured off when we went out. No one really saw a difference. We were just one giant family in a big, ugly, white station wagon. One family with similar faces, but completely different personalities. The sheep and the goats that Jesus is talking about in the text are kind of like that. Here's a fun fact for you about today's text. In North America, sheep and goats are easily distinguishable because of breeding over time, right? And so get a sheep in your mind. You have a sheep, they're soft and they're woolly, they're fluffy. You think of like Jesus, the Lamb of God. You think of like in green pastures, all of that, right? And when we think about goats, we think about like just animals that do whatever they want. They will eat anything, they will tear up your stuff, right? We think of goats like that. Well, here's the thing. If you remember in middle school science, you'll recall learning about the classification of living things. Now, if you are a a former nerd like me, then you remember that this was called the taxonomic ranks, right? And so you remember you had kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Here's the thing. Stick with me. If If you don't love science, we're going somewhere. So sheep and goats are from the same kingdom, Phylum, class, order, and family. But that's where the likeness stops. Historically and still today, in certain parts of Asia and certain parts of Africa, sheep and goats actually still look almost identical. And this is because they come from the same family. And no one but a shepherd can easily tell the difference. Sit with that for a second. They come from the same family and no one but the shepherd can easily tell the difference. Jesus knows this and 2,000 years ago likely saw this. And so it's this intelligent example that he uses to teach us. See, just being a part of the herd, blending in with the family is not what calls us out. We are in fact all God's children. We are all God's good creation, yes, but there is something that only the shepherd can truly distinguish in us. And you know what that is? It's his heart. Like growing up when my family faced the world, we looked enough alike, and the only people who really knew the difference were our parents. Only the shepherd really knows if we are his sheep. Only the shepherd. And here's the thing, that's not a value assessment. I wanna make sure we're clear. That's not a value assessment, but that is a heart assessment. Jesus says, I love you enough to live out the example of the life that I want for you. And I even left my spirit to help you copy what you saw because if we're all honest with ourselves, it is really hard to copy Jesus sometime. In a world of comment sections and rage, it is hard to copy Jesus. But he says, with me, it's not impossible because you were chosen You are brought into the family of God. You are up to the task. You're chosen for this. Chosen to be countercultural. Chosen to be an earth shaker in the name of Jesus. The only one we have that's worth copying. Here's the thing. Before everything kind of shut down in terms of travel, uh, I had the incredible opportunity, the incredible privilege to visit a place called Bartabwa, Kenya. And it's there that I saw what it looked like to copy the hands and heart of Jesus in real time. I got to meet some local World Vision staff. I got to learn from their expertise in community development and water engineering. I got to see Jesus reflected in the work and the people. Because it's one thing to hear like, we're the largest Christian humanitarian organization. We're the largest, world's largest provider of clean water. It's one thing to hear that, but it's another thing to get there and see it's more than that, to see that it's the heart of Jesus at work. So here's the thing, when we left the airport, we had to drive for hours to get into the community. And on the way, I got to see why all of this really matters. Because we saw children, young, tiny, adorable little children carrying whatever jug or tin or carrier that they had. And they were walking along these carved, uh, rugged little paths into these shadowed woods, all hiking to get water that looked frankly like sludge. Water 
that kills a thousand of them a day. But I also saw something else. I didn't just see that. I saw when we got there, when we got to the community, we got to see the power of choice firsthand. See, while we were there, we also saw what happens when women and girls get to choose school over water walks and food grown in their own yards instead of death by lack of access. They didn't just tell us their testimonies. They showed us their miracles. A new school being opened with the backdrop being their old school made with mud and branches. We saw young community health workers who had been trained and now were spending their time training hundreds of other families in life-saving practices. We saw water pumps, huge water pumps, pumping down into the community, and then we got to go hear the neighbors tell us how God had put it on their heart to not stop until everyone had the same thing. I listened to the community tell me what it meant for children and families to begin having a choice. Miracles, they said. That's the word we kept hearing, just miracles. I saw the miracle of choosing relationships, right? One of, and one family willing to imitate the servant heart of Jesus and wash feet all the way across the ocean. I saw it when we went to the home of a beautiful little girl named Anita. And so I had already heard about Anita from one of my colleagues named Johnny who lives in Southern California. He talked so much about her but we got to go to her home. And what started a few years ago as just $39 from Johnny's family in California to her family in Kenya started to be exposed as so much more. What started as one family just deciding to help another one became letters and love and prayers being exchanged. And Anita then, in that moment, walking us to the center of her yard and pumping fresh water that had never been there before. And then her dad stepped forward in his best suit, beaming with so much pride. And he told us about how his daughters were now able to go to school and how they had their own garden instead of questioning when he'd be able to provide the next meal for his family. Because two families connected to each other and heard Jesus' words, copy me. And they exchanged power and pity for love and relationship. So here's the thing, what if we, as sheep of the shepherd, we gave up what we thought mattered the most in exchange for kingdom building relationships, real Jesus on the mountainside, copy me relationship. That radical reversal is exactly what our ministry at World Vision has been thinking a lot about. It is why, even as someone who does full-time ministry as a pastor, why I've been so committed to it, because we've been thinking about, how do I love like Jesus loves? How do I care like Jesus cares? How do we really pour out our life and copy him? So not long ago, we realized like, hey, we've been doing this for 70 years serving God across the world for 70 years, providing needs and communities for 70 years, serving churches for 70 years. But it's time to lean in and listen to what God is saying right now. And out of that listening, something fresh and something incredible was born. And Jesus' words really started to echo in all of us, copy me. And not for the sake of attention like me and my little brother, right? Not for the sake of attention, but for the sake of transformation. The countercultural Jesus asks us to do what makes absolutely no sense, just like he did. Think about it. He gave up a powerful seat with the Father just to be with us. See, culture says looking like the hero, looking like Jesus means looking like we're the hero. It means picking out the people that we feel need help and deserve our hand. Culture says we decide who's chosen. And the result is that they get help and we feel good, we get to post it, and now here's the thing. It's not terrible, but what if there's more? What if we took Jesus' radical approach to turning the whole world upside down? So here's the thing. I have a powerful invitation. That is what has brought me here. That is why I have, we have canceled our own service in Nashville to be right here because I have this powerful invitation and it's kind of to a family reunion of sorts, right? The, today, there are about 1,400 children in each of two really special communities. One in a place called Bude Kalamba, Uganda, and another one in Kitosur, 
Ecuador. And those children would love a God-centered relationship with you and with your family. And you get to remind them and yourself that we are a part of a family that's much bigger than we have ever known and reverse the false narrative that those who have less somehow are less. And I wanna invite you to do what Jesus does, affirm their inherent dignity to co-labor with Christ in restoring their broken circumstances. There are 7,668 miles between these two communities and more than 10,000 miles total from here at Hope Church to them. And it's incredible how Jesus and extending his love somehow make that feel like right next door, like a neighbor. Because these aren't strangers, these are God's children, and so that means these are our people. These communities where God has allowed Hope Church to already show so much love, not far away from them, are filled with beautiful children who still lack the basic access to resources to thrive. And yet, I saw with my own eyes, they are so full of hope. They are so sure that God is still moving on their behalf. And because God moved on the hearts of your leadership team here and Pastor Rufus, they responded to the question, what would it look like to be family for them? And there are about, I know he mentioned there are about 120 or so of you who are already leading the way for the rest of us to go out and and respond to the tugging that God has put on your heart. And here's the thing, I heard some great wisdom from a pastor not long ago at another uh, Chosen Sunday, and he said, we all have this, um, this message that we get, like, go out and change the world. And he's like, you can't, because it can feel so overwhelming, but here's the catch. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. So today we're inviting you, each and every one of you that feels led by God to sponsor a child in a very, very special way. And I know um, we've heard of this before, but this is something unique that I wanna invite you into. I wanna invite you to say yes to one of these 3,000 children and families in Bude Kalamba and Quito, right, who are desperately waiting on a relationship that looks like Jesus. And you'll witness what I witness. What our little, me and my husband's little $39 a month can do. For us, that sacrifice just looked like, honestly, skipping one meal out a month, right? And you'll witness what it can do. It can literally transform someone's life. One of the things I love most about World Vision is that it is a community-based model. And so that means, yes, we get a relationship with our sponsored child, Benita, but it's not just her that benefits. It's not just her family that even benefits. It's the entire community because for every one child that's in a sponsored relationship, four more people in that community are benefiting. And the reality is, as these children are sponsored, everyone in the community gets access to the water. Everyone gets to go to school. Friends, I can't leave here without sharing the power of that, the power of copying the ways of the countercultural, earth-shaking Jesus. And typically, uh, as I was saying, the, the way that you would do it, you would go out into the lobby and you see these beautiful photos Some of you, if I have some concert goers, you may have seen uh, us do this at concerts, right? And we still do. Uh, And so you go out, you see these beautiful photos, and you would choose a child, right, based on different things. It might be, hey, they have a birthday. Hey, something about them just drew me to them. Hey, their smile. And you choose it, right? Picture that. But now, the last few years, when we've been praying these big prayers and trying to hear how to serve God's vulnerable children better, we ask God, What if we flipped human power for God's kingdom come? What if we decided, we wanted to know what it looked like to put the power of choice in a child's hands? What if we allowed them to choose us? Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at HopeChurchMemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.